sounds a little bit like uh, something you get in an Italian restaurant, but it's not really. It's, uh, it's an electromagnetic force that is ma manifested through meditation that comes up the spinal column to impact on the pineal gland of the brain and has a, an effect of opening the right hemisphere of the brain and recreating that which is quote-unquote God consciousness. But it involves that which is called the seven chakras. That is a very mystique term, and of course it's Greek, but it's not really, it's Hindu. To many people today, say, so, well, my God, what the heck is that? The premise is that there are seven nerve centers or psychological wheels that start at the base of the spine and raised up through the spinal column to that which is the crown of the head or the pineal gland of the brain. And the energy through meditation must open those seven seals as it rises up before one can reach a higher level of consciousness called what Buddha called Nirvana, which Jesus calls the kingdom of God. It means uh, the seven chakras are wheels, but these are psychological wheels. They're, if somebody was to operate on you, they're not going to find these things. Okay. But that's not a problem. They'll say, well, they can't exist because if they take your brain out and operate on it, they're not going to find one of your thoughts either, are they? They're not going to find one of your dreams or one of your hopes or one of your fears, but they're there still the same. So these seven chakras then are situated along the spinal column, and the energy starts at the base of the spine. Uh, let me see where I am. I'm in the wrong place there. Okay. The first chakra, if we're going to move along the spine. The first chakra is at the very lowest. It lies coiled. It's a serpent lying coiled three and a half times. Okay. This is the serpent which lies coiled at the base of the spine three and a half times. Now remember you don't have worms. I'm not talking as a serpent lying inside of yourself. This is a mystical thing. It's energy. It coiled three and a half times and the reason that it's coiled three and a half times is because it must add up to nine which is the number of consciousness, okay? Nine is the number of Adam. The Sanskrit value of the word Adam is nine. Adam means consciousness, okay? So if you were to add up 666, six, six, you get one eight. The beast is you. If you want to see the beast, you go out, take a look. There's a picture hanging over the sink in the men's room and the ladies' room. That's the beast, okay? When you go to the very next line, it says there's 144,000 saved. One plus four plus four is nine, which means the higher consciousness is salvation. The lower consciousness is the devil, or hell, or whatever you want to call it. The entire Bible is built around that. In fact, in John 21, 6, Jesus says, cast your net to the right side and you will find. He's talking to the right hemisphere of the brain. When you look at John 21, 11, it says, when they caught all the fish, they brought in 153 fish. It means that Jesus was not talking about fish. He wasn't talking about boats. He's talking about you and me. Cast your energy to the right side. You'll find truth. You'll find yourself. So how they operated then as far as the serpent coiled three and a half times, and the purpose of that being coiled three and a half times, was three times the zodiacal circle of 360 degrees, which is 1,080 degrees, which adds up to nine, okay? We say, well, why half? You know, why not just let it go there? What's the sense of having one half times 360, which would be what, 180? Okay, which comes into 1,260, which also adds up to nine. But doesn't, you know, doesn't tell you what's the need. Why not just let it go there? The reason is you're going to take care of the numbers one, which is God, two, which is you, six, which is that, which is doctrines, and move that out to encompassing that number nine, and also to follow up with the mysticism that surrounds the various numbers I've got up here. Number, let, me, let me show you what I'm talking about by looking in the Bible. Go to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation. Revelation 11. Revelation chapter 11. Okay. Now we're going to be talking about the two witnesses as you get to this book of Revelation, which is the pineal gland and the pituitary gland of the brain. Okay. Revelation chapter 11, go to verse 3. And I'll show you why the serpent must coil three and a half times and not just three in order to come out to nine. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand 203 score. Three score is three times 20 or 60. So you have 1,260 days. Okay? That's very, very important, and it's important in understanding mystical numerology that the 1,260 has to be revealed. And the only way it can be is three times 360, and one half of 360 is 180. And basically, you'll find out that's why Jesus Christ's uh, uh, um, ministry was three and a half years. Everything in the Bible is predicated 
coming out to the number nine with a whole bunch of numbers in between, okay? So the serpent has to coil three and a half times, and it sleeps within you, the energy sleeps within you at the base of your spine in an area called the Muldahara Chakra, okay? M, let me make sure I spell it right, M-U-L-D-A-H-A-R-A. -A -A. Muldahara Chakra, that's the base of the spine. It's the root base, its element is the earth, it has four crimson deep red petals, and its symbol is ambition, power, the base feeling, you know. That's what's there. We'll just call it the ego. Everything that has actually manifested in your life that basically causes you trouble finds its way out of the muldahara or the base chakra. That's the lower basis instinct that we all, you know, let me, this is such a neat thing. Let me just diverse for just a second. I, I shared it with you the other day. I shared it with people this morning. But I was at a conference <clears throat> with our company a few days ago. And we were learning from a psychologist. His name is Rich Petrino. He's an excellent psychologist. And he teaches getting to know people, getting to understand people. And he said there's an interesting thing from, that is Japanese, actually. And it's called, part of psychology, is harage. H-A-R-A-G-E. Harage. And it, it, it is founded by a, you know, Japanese psychologist named Roy. And it means getting into one's stomach. And the ancient people of the East, he said, believed that in order for one to be in a complete oneness with another, you had to get in that person's stomach. And getting this and understanding this, you realize Jesus Christ then saying, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. In other words, he has to get into your stomach. The point that I'm making of this is that this is an ancient Eastern belief. And so when we look as Westerners and try to say, Muldahara, what the heck is he talking about? I don't, I don't know anything about that. You have to start changing the way you think. You have to start changing the things that you read. And you have to start looking in a broader way to familiarize yourself with the basis of what life is. When you take the seven chakras, that I'm talking to you about, that's the seven days that Joshua walked around Jericho. There was no man that walked around a town and the walls fell down. That's not what it means. It means that that impulse, which is the Joshua within you, if it climbs the seven chakras, the wall will fall down that separates you from the holy city, which is the right hemisphere of the brain. It has nothing to do with a man running around a town and walls falling down. But yet we, we, we take it literally. And this is a my God, he walked around the wall seven times and the walls fell. And people will do that. I've seen people who, who wanted their cars to be fixed or something would walk around the car seven times and pray for it. They're literalizing these things and missing the whole thing. It has to do with raising yourself up the seven chakras to cause the wall that divides the carnal mind from the divine mind to fall so that you can enter into the right. So it's a, it's a symbolic story. It's a parable. As, as the Apostle Paul said, all of these things are parables. If you go then into that Muldahara chakra, the element uh, is ambition and power. When you go to the second chakra, and we're kind of moving from the top, but we'll move up uh, to the second one. It is called Svadas Histanit, S-V-A-D, S-V-A-D-H-I-S-T-A-N-N-A. And it's in the sexual area. And you know what it means? This is interesting. Sexual area. You know what the word means? Her favorite resort. That's what the word means. Her favorite resort. And I might say we could add his favorite resort too, right? <laughs> oh, come on now. Well, you know, as Joan Rivers said, let's talk. Let's be mature about this. Right. Its element is water. It is a lotus of six vermilion petals, reddish orange, and it's love and kingship. People who find themselves mounting to this area, their energy mounting to that area, are very sexually oriented. It's called a very Freudian area because it's filled with sex, repressed sex, frustrated re uh, sex, and then fulfilled sex. You know, all of the things that, that you have running through your mind, even some of you have had it running through your mind since you've been sitting here. Amazing as it seems in this holy sanctuary, sitting there with the Bibles on your hand, some of you have entertained yourself with some orgasmic things popping in your head. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. So, you know, if you, were, if you were to study psychology, or you study basic psychiatry, you'll find out that people go away while they're listening to someone about every two minutes, they're gone. In other words, you'll sit here, you're staring at me, you're gone. 
and generally about 85 to 90 percent of the time psychiatrists have found when they're gone they're dwelling in sexual fantasies right Mary Mary's laughing back there she <laughs> you of all of us okay but that's the way it is now you can't admit that because you've got a Bible in your hand and you're in church and it's Sunday and God bless you you can't admit that but in your heart you know it's true because it is true it's the way it is and, and once you understand that, look, at all, look around at your neighbors here, and all of these people are going through all of these panties, then you can relax, because they're all just as screwed up as I am. Hey, what the heck? And when we all realize that, then we're not guilty, and we're not finding fault with each other. It's the way it is. There's nothing wrong with it. Perfectly all right, because that's the way the mind works. Now we go to the third one, which is called Manapura. It sounds like a, a Hawaiian song. Oh, Muna Manapura. Do you ever hear that one? Didn't Manapura is the third one, and it's at the navel. The navel. And Manapura means, what do you think it means? The navel? It means city of the shining jewel. Now you know. The jewel in the navel. The, what was her name? Salome or Salami or whatever it was. <laughs> it's exactly what it means. The jewel, the city of the shining jewel. It has ten petals, the color of dark storm clouds, and its element is fire and one who rises here okay one who's this is the base part this is the sexual area once you get to manapura you'll find your energies are self-centered consuming conquering trying to get everybody to conform to his way this basically is where religion is right there the city of the shining jewel nobody can have an opinion other than that it's got to be our way or you're not allowed to speak you know basically that's where manapura is so you see, these are the three lower chakras that must be overcome. Because each one of us has this. We've got a base instinct, which is pretty wild. We've got a sexual instinct, which is wilder. And then here, you've got this third instinct, which is self-serving ego. And you've got to overcome this. How are you going to do this? What are you going to do? You're going to go to church, you're going to read, you're going to sing Amazing Grace, and that's going to do it? You're going to come up and sign a card? You're going to go to this Bible study. What are you going to do? It's not going to change anything. You know, I can read Amazing Grace, and I can sing the songs, and I can go to church. It's not going to change the color of my eyes. It's not going to change my hair. It's not going to change it. It's not going to change my age. It's not going to do anything. What do I have to do? I have to make adjustments. That's why Jesus Christ said, What do you people call me? Lord, you don't do what I tell you to do. Luke 6, 46. You can't claim Jesus Christ. You can't believe Jesus Christ. You can't say Jesus Christ is Lord. That's not what it means. It means you've got to do what the guy said, and the guy said, practice the single eye, seek within yourself, or it won't work. And, and, and you see, here though, the people who teach religion, they don't want you to know that. Because if you find that out, suddenly you're going to be filled with Christ consciousness, you're going to be set free, you don't need them anymore. Then what happens? What happens to all of this money that they're raking in? What happens to all of this authority and this control that they have? It's gone. And to me, it can't crash fast enough. I love Jesus Christ's remarks when they said, Wow, what a church. Look at that beautiful church. He said, I got to one rock left standing on top of the other one. He was contempt for it. Because he knew what it did to people. It takes their money, puts them under guilt, and restricts them from expanding themselves and finding out who they really are. It is the Antichrist. Without a doubt, it's the Antichrist. So, you now come in your movement up the chakras above that, which is the animal. The animal nature here, what Buddha teaches about the animal nature is very interesting. And he says, you've got to get away from it. Because the animal nature that we dwell in in the lower mind is very dangerous. And the reason he said it's very, very dangerous is because the animal nature is predictable. When you go hunting, you know exactly what the animal that you're hunting is going to do by instinct. And so you can lay a trap for him. And as the animal follows its instinct, got him. And Buddha says, in the same way, when you dwell in your animal nature, you are predictable. And when you are predictable, people will know how to turn you on and turn you off. They'll know what you want to hear and what you don't want to hear, and you'll be sucked right into their little trap. And it's interesting that people try to keep others away from here. And the reason is, the ones setting the trap don't want you to find out where the traps are. And that's the most important thing you got in your life, to find out where their traps are, so that you become free. 
And free means not joining this church because nobody belongs to this church. Free does not mean following me. God forbid how screwed up you could get. Freedom means following the light within yourself, the Christ within you, to be the very best you you can be. People say, what's the theory of this church? What's the doctrine of this church? I says, who knows? Ask him. He has just 45 different doctrines. Who can, whatever you want it to be. Whatever you want it to be is what it is, because it has to be true to you. And what your light is and what your need is is not necessarily what mine is. See? So let's go up now to the fourth chakra, which is called Anahatta. And we'll get into Om here. Anahatta. A-N-A-H-A-T-A. -A -A. Okay. Anahatta. And it is, um, it's the heart chakra. It's at the heart. It's started to get above the animal nature into something a little reasonable. You know what it means? Not hit. Not hit. And what is, uh, where that comes from is an old Buddhist expression which means the sound that is not made by any two things striking together. In other words, you know what the sound of my hands is. But what is the sound of my left hand? See. That's also what they call a, um, a koan in, in, in meditation, uh, where you begin to say those things. The sound that you cannot hear is the beauty of God, because as we begin to understand, in life, if we hear two things touching, they make a sound, whether it be my hands or even words as your tongue moves and vibrates the atmosphere. It sends vibrations that are translated through the ears of a person into intelligible communication. So then what would be the sound made not that way? What would be, like it says, you know what it says in the Bible? It says that God lives in temples made without human hands. Now that's an interesting thing. What would be temples made without human hands? The only temples in the universe made without human hands. You want to find them? Take your fingers with me right now. Come on. Come on. Nobody's seen you. It's no big deal. Put them over here. There they are. The only temples in the universe made without human hands are on the side of your head. And that's where it said God lives. Isn't that great? That's why Jesus Christ drove the money changers out of a temple. See, he's driving the thoughts out of your head. And so here then, when we find the sound that's not made with... With, with, with hands or the sound that's not made physically, it's primal energy which the universe is a manifestation. This is the primal. It can be cared, you can compare it to the humming of a generator in a nuclear plant or the humming in the generator of an electric plant. Go, the center of things, you know. Sometimes if you go into a large building somewhere and you go down to the generator, or if you get on a, a big Navy ship or something, you hear down at the bottom, you know, it's that center, it's that sound. Where does it come from? It's basically the normally unheard humming of protons and neutrons of the atom, the interior sound of primal energy, the vibrations of which we are all part. And what is the sound? The sound is... Om. 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 That's the sound. A universal sound. You know what I hear? You want to hear God? Many of you have never heard God. Let's hear God. Take those two fingers. Come on. Oops, I get it. Oh, if you're on a television, I'm going to show you. Take these two fingers, plug your ears, and listen very carefully. You hear it? Mm. Now, I'll be telling you, if you plug your fingers in and you don't hear it, bye bye. That's you. That's God. That's the center of you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that exciting? That is the center. That's the electronic center of the universe within you. It's the exact same sound that you hear in there that's humming in the center of the universe. It's the sound. And when you get to understand that sound, you come into a harmony with the center. You come into harmony with the universe. You come into a harmony with life. Here's a little one to sort of break the, break the mood here to, to, to get you a little excited. For it. We'll come back to this in a second. Here, watch. You see? First man, center of all universe, the center of all life is who? Adam. Okay? You know what it said in Memphis, Egypt? The first man, born of God? Adam. The center of the nucleus of all things? Adam. Huh? God wants to procreate. If you take a, an electron out of an atom, 
you procreate the energy. God took a rib out of Adam, multiplied the species. What the Bible was really telling you was that in the eons of time, all things began by the splitting of the atom. Okay? I just threw that in. There's no extra charge. I wasn't even going to do that. Wait, wait a minute. What? 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 That may make sense. Why should that offend you? You see the thing? If it makes sense, it offends people. Those people couldn't deal with that. He split the atom. My God, that's horrible. No, it makes more sense that he ripped a rib out of this poor guy and made a woman. How would you like that? Does that make sense to you? Or, does it, or would you say, yes, indeed, he split the atom and all energy and all life procreated, which is exactly what the Bible was telling you. Well, why not understand it? To me, it makes it a heck of a lot more religious, a heck of a lot more understanding of God to realize that the Bible itself, not a, not a science book, uh -huh. not, a, not a physics book, the Bible itself is telling us in symbolic language that when the atoms split in the infinite beginnings of time, all life came forth. Oh, wow. See? It's all there. It's all written there, but it's all written in symbols. But we've been reading it literally, and we've missed it. And yet you'll, yet, yet you'll go over to somebody and say, hey, come on, let's you and me shoot the bull. What do you do, pack a pistol? You got a rifle? You're not going to shoot a bull. You're going to have a conversation. You've got to understand that the Bible talks exactly the same way as you talk. See? So the sound of Om in Sanskrit is part of two sounds. Okay? In Sanskrit, which is ancient Hindu, that sound of O-M is part of two sounds, which is A-U. Oh. See, thus the sacred symbol is A-U-M, which is four elements. Okay? Now, you, you don't have to write this down. You don't have to understand this. You don't have to believe it. I don't care. You know, wh who cares? What's the difference? I'm telling you this. You want to go out and study the ancient where it comes from, you'll find that this is a fact. And, and you'll find out that once you begin to understand this, you'll find something that you never knew all of your life, of all of the religious places you went. You'll find out the actual vibrating universal sound that can place you in harmony with the universe that you live in. You, you, can't, you can't sit here and say, I don't want to get involved with this universe stuff, this astrological stuff. That You're living on a planet. You live on a ball that's going through the universe at 40,000 miles an hour, nobody driving it, and you say you don't want to get involved. Here you are standing here, it's going in between black holes and planets and shooting stars and galaxies, and, and oh, I don't want to get involved in that stuff. How are you not going to get involved in that stuff? You're like a flea on a tennis ball. Pow! There you go. And we're all running around. Here you are going through black holes and white holes and stars and galaxies on this planet. Nobody knows where it's spinning in the universe, and you're looking for security. Oh, I want security for my family. Where are you going to get security? Begin to understand the magnitude of this thing. Begin to understand how much you have to trust the guy that's hitting this ball. I mean, could you get off? You know, like, say, stop the world, I want to get home. So let's begin to understand where all of this comes from. And, and, and for God's sake, get out of the book cult of religion and get into the nature cult of God. Begin to understand his ways. Here is a God who, in Genesis, he says, I made the stars, let them be for signs. And the religious say, don't look at them. Stay away from that stuff. If it says in the Bible, let the stars be for signs, don't you want to find out what the signs mean? Psalm 147, God named all the stars. He called them Aquarius and Libra. And Li don't you want to know why? But they say, stay away from that stuff. They don't go near that stuff. Why? Because we said so. You want to be saved, you got to stay with us. Hey, be born again, born again. And they're all miserable people. They, they'll kill you for a penny. They hate each other. Stay away from that stuff. So they say, can I don't believe these things can influence me? Can these stars influence me astrologically? So, uh, Job 38, 32 says, can you bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades? What's that sound like? Can you loose the bands of Orion? You can read about it. Can you bring forth Maseroth? You know what Maseroth is? The 12 signs of the zodiac. Who found Jesus? Was it the evangelist? Why didn't they get an evangelist to find Jesus? Why didn't they? Because you know why? He'd have, he'd have, you'd have to have a MasterCard to get to the manger. Uh, we, know you, we take Visa or MasterCard. You've got to blush in there, and I'll give you some of the hay. I, I, I breathed on this hay, and here you can have it. What is this? I don't think so. So who was it? Who did they pick? This is this should blow your side. Who does the Bible pick to find Jesus? 
the Magi. You know what the Magi is? You know what the word Magi? You know what the root is? Ed C. They were magicians. They were astrologers. They came from Iran. So here the Bible picks astrologers. And then Jesus Christ comes up in the middle of all of this and says, My friends, I'll tell you a secret. When you see the man with the pitcher of water, that's what's happening now, Aquarius. Go into the house, which is yourself. Go to the upper room and I'll meet you there. This is it. Exactly as he said. The man with the pitcher of water. The sound of all of four elements. One is A. Two is U. Three is M. And the fourth element is the space and the silence that surrounds it. And it rises and it falls and it rises and it falls like the moon and like the tides and like the sun and like all of what life is. And like you. And like you. Here you're sitting. You can, oh, I don't believe in that reincarnation. You've been alive 15,000 times. I don't believe in that stuff. I, how come I never remember? You can't even remember the dreams you had last night. You had about 30 of those. I don't know. See, why not find out? Why not get in harmony with it instead of fighting it and begin to understand the reason for all of these things? What happens is in Om, okay, the, the letter A proceeds from the back of the mouth. Ah. The U comes forward, up through the throat. The sound of the air mass is filled, and the M is closed at the lips. Oh, like that. Oh. And the syllable then contains all of the vowels of speech. The holy syllable thus contains the seed of all the words, the names of all the things, and it becomes the holy sound, the universal sound. From the most ancient of times, from the Hindus, back of, of the Bhagavad Gita, which quotes it 7,000 years ago, where Jesus Christ then comes forth and says, practice the single eye. Practice the single eye, which is on raising yourself up into nirvana. In the Upanishads, the four elements of Om and silence refer to four planes of consciousness, which is waking consciousness, dream consciousness, deep dreamless sleep, and the formless waste or darkness over the sea. So all creation, from the formless physical to the divine, silence tells us what's around us supporting them. Now let's go to that, we're running out of time, we got to get done with Let's go to the fifth chakra so we, we wrap this up, okay? We're at the fourth. The fifth chakra is the larynx. It's called Vishuddha, V-I-S-H-U-D-D-A. It's at the throat. It's at the throat. And it's purification. The lotus of 16 petals of smoky purple hue, and its element is ether, which is wisdom. And so here's the point now as we get up to the fifth and the sixth chakra, where you, re you leave religion. You leave yourself. You leave that which is the mind, and, and you start then to move up into the realms of God. The soul is being purged by this energy. And you're becoming one with this om. You're becoming, preparing for the beatific vision of God. And this is where we get to now. The sixth center, the mystic inward eye opens. And one experiences the sight and sound of God. And this is the single eye that Jesus Christ was talking about. You see, this is what people don't understand. You go into, you know, I'm a born-again Christian, I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Methodist. Or, they never heard of the single eye opening at the sixth chakra. Never heard about it. But Jesus Christ has practiced the single eye. It's Hindu. Sorry. Goes back 7,000, 5, 4,000 years before he was born... These were the instructions, and yet, you know, Christianity, of course, stay away from this stuff, yet these are the instructions of Jesus Christ. You cannot get these people to leave this blasted system in order to follow Jesus Christ because they don't have the guts to do it. And you've got to have the guts to step out from the crowd and say, here, take it, stick it, I'm going, and I'm going to be free, and I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. And if I've got to follow him off a cliff, I'll follow him off a cliff. Because you know what? When you open the Bible, and when you read that Bible, you will find that Jesus Christ said everything totally opposite to what these people out there say he said. Oh, they say he's coming back on a white horse. Here he comes over Kennedy Airport on his white horse. Just missed the 747. What's funny about that? Because he said the kingdom does not come with observation. The kingdom is within you. No, I don't pay attention to that. Brother so-and-so said he's coming back. He says he's coming back, he's come back, and the point is he said, just like John the Baptist was a reincarnation of Elijah, I will reincarnate in you, and just as they didn't recognize me and him, or, or, or John, or Elijah and him, they won't recognize me and you, because you will be that which is the Christ. You will be that which is the light of the world. Yeah. Let's go to the sixth center. This is great. This is the head chakra. Guess what the name of it is? You're going to love it. Ajna. 
you ever say? Well, it gives me odds. That's what it is. It's two white pedals. It's the white horse. What do you want to talk about? This is where it comes from. Ajna. You know what? You missed all of this stuff. You don't know any stuff of this stuff. All of this stuff exists. This is everything Jesus talks about. It's everything the Bible talks about, and you missed the whole thing. Here you come. You got to wind up in a basement of Vito's Electric Store, whatever this place is, in order to find out this stuff. Isn't this bizarre? And these guys are coming on television with their credit cards and all of this stuff, taking your money, and they're telling you nothing. What do they tell you? Oh, you got to follow Jesus. Where is he? Where the heck am I going to go? Oh, you got to live, uh, you got to follow the Lord. How are you going to follow the Lord? Claim Jesus, everything will get better. You have to come and take the car tomorrow. What do I do now? How, how, what do you do? And then you begin to realize that what Jesus was talking about is this. What Jesus was talking about is that inner kingdom. He says you take away the key because you don't enter within yourself. See? So Ajna then becomes that, that place of the sixth. But there's still a separation. Even here, the ultimate aim is not the bliss of the sixth. That's what religion really yearns for, a heaven somewhere. They're going to go someplace. You know, you're going to go to heaven, right? Did you hear? You're going to go to heaven. Where the heck is it? Was it Pluto? Mars? Where is it? Why does it have to be in the sky somewhere? Why can't it be the big, blue, beautiful marble created in the center of all things? And do you realize the only thing that keeps the planet you're dwelling on from being heaven is your mind? Once the minds of people are changed within, the outside will become heaven. That's all. But uh, I, don't, I agree with Christianity. It's eternal life. You go to heaven. But it's right here. Why does it have to be in some planet somewhere? Do you know what would, what would happen if they all went to heaven, up, up in this Pluto somewhere, if they all went there this week? In six months, it would be hell. Six months. There would be guys digging the streets of gold out by the roots, peddling it. You know, selling pieces of the, the, the divine God. Here, I, I met Jesus. Here's a piece of his uh, handkerchief. Here, I, you know. They'll be selling autographed pictures of you and St. Peter and all this crazy stuff. Six months, the whole place would be hell. Rip down. Because it has nothing to do with the physical place. It has to do with that which is within you. That's why the Bible says your mind has to be renewed. But you have to be willing to start thinking and to start understanding the origin of things in life itself. Okay? That's what's so important to do. So, we go to that. We've got to change that which is the sixth into that which is the seventh. See, when Jesus Christ was at the wedding in Cana, how many water pots did they bring for him to change? They brought six. Because the six has to be changed into the seventh. Doctrines, that which is the law, that which is understanding, has to be gone beyond. We have to go to the seventh, which is kind of a tough word. S-A-H-A-S-A-R-A. Sahasara, the thousand petal crown, the thousand petal. When you read in the book of Revelation, it says that Jesus Christ will come and live a thousand years. Satan will be bound a thousand years because you are now dwelling in that of the thousand petal lotus. Sahasara, which is the ultimate crown chakra, you have opened up that which is the God conscious. Ninety percent of your brain is dormant. You use 10% of it. And what does God say he wants you to do? Tithe. And these people have ripped the wallets out of your pockets by the roots. And it doesn't have a thing to do with money. He's saying, give me that 10% which is on the left side. Shut it down in your meditation and I will give you the 90%. I will open to you the riches of the heavens. I will open to you that which is the right side. And that is the whole question of tithing. And that's the thousand year reign of Christ is when people rise themselves up to that crown and reach that place of bliss. Everything is within you. The kingdom of God is within you, Jesus Christ. And if you'll understand that, you know it's one of the interesting things when they took Jesus Christ and they said to Jesus Christ, hey, wait a minute, pal. So where the heck are you get off teaching this stuff? That's what the priest said. To him. Who told you this stuff? And Jesus turned around and said, you know, he thought of something. John the Baptist was practicing a Buddhist ritual. Came from the cult of the water god, Ia. Baptism. Never happened in the Old Testament. Never happened anywhere. Came out of the ancient Buddhic. Ia, the water god. Funny thing was when you translate the word Ia down through the various 
language isn't the English, it's John. But I'll tell you that another time. See what Jesus did? He knew. He said, these guys aren't going to know anything about Buddhism. He said, I'll tell you what. When you can tell me where John the Baptist gets the authority to do what he did, I'll tell you where I get the authority to do what I do. Because he got it from the same place. And then this Jesus Christ who you have on your Christmas cards and on your Easter bunnies and all of this stuff, takes himself down and bows his knee to this strange dude down at the creek and immerses himself in a Buddhist ritual called baptism. Which has nothing to do with water in the first place. Means nothing about water. Hey, do me a favor. Go to, find the book of Hebrews in your Bible. Uh, and we're, we're almost done here. I'm going to let you out of here. Go to the book of Hebrews, okay? You see it? What page is it on? You have a Bible? Hebrews chapter 6. All right, Hebrews chapter 6. You got it? 203, page 203. I want to show you something. What, I, what I'm trying to get through to you. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, page 203 in the New Testament. Look at the top of it and I'll tell you what page it is. 203. You with me? You want to read it with me? What does it say? Therefore, chapter 6, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ. Do you see that? Do you see it? Do your friends up there see it that are spitting all over the building? Leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection. You know what perfection is, my friends? Oh, that's perfection. Where you have no input whatsoever, that's perfection. And I want to say, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead work. Get away from that. And look at the next one. No more faith in God. No more faith in God. Did you hear that? The Apostle Paul says you shouldn't have faith in God. Why? Because faith is only something you need when you're not sure. Oh, I've got a lot of faith. If that means you're not sure, there's an outside chance you might be wrong. But when you know, when you're absolutely positive, you got your foot in your shoe, how do you know? Do you got to have faith or can you feel it? Is it alive? It's a part of you. It's throbbing. It's in you and you are in it and it's you and it is one. You don't have to have faith. And the Apostle Paul is telling you in his Bible, get away from it. Look at the next one. Get away from the doctrines of what? Baptisms. That's all they do. First thing you got to do when you show up, they got to stick your head in the creek. Oh, they put your head in the water. Why? Well, that's because we always do it. What's he say? Get away from that. Look what else he says. Laying out of hands. Don't do that anymore. That's all they do. Yeah? Put your hands on something. Bang, over they go. Yeah, they fall over the floor. Oh, this is the Holy Spirit. It says here, don't do that. And what about resurrection of the dead? Don't, don't believe that anymore. Dead bodies don't rise. People do. And when your body dies, you don't die. When you take your car to the record yard, they don't take you in it. It's only dead bodies. And dead bodies do not share in the resurrection. Resurrection is of the spirit. It's that which is you. And the lower spirit rises and up to the higher realms of what we're talking about. Sahasara. That's resurrection. The Apostle Paul said, flesh and blood can have no part in the kingdom of God. And that which is flesh and blood does not share in the resurrection. So the Apostle Paul don't believe that. Stuff. Eternal judgment. Get rid of that. There is no such thing. All of these things are given for you to begin to understand. There is no guilt. There is, there is nothing but you work in your way as many lifetimes as it takes into the arms of God, into the arms of Christ. Why don't you have to, look, why don't you have to understand baptism? Let me show you why. You're going to go down, they're going to stick your head in the water, right? Big deal. Here. Here's your head. Here are the five stages of consciousness in Greek, and this is where it comes from. Earth, water, air, fire, air, fire, and a renewed mind. That's the five stages of consciousness in Greek. That's a baptism. You take the earth, which is your head, submit it to the water, which is the second stage of consciousness, which is the truth. You then rise up into the third stage of consciousness, which is air, which is above human thought. That's nirvana. That's the kingdom of God. Where there is no thought, there is air. That's why people say, you're an airhead. Okay? Air. And when you rise into the air, you then come up to that which is the fourth stage of the fire of the baptism of the Spirit. It is all psychological. It has nothing to do with sticking your head in a water or a creek or anything like that. And the Apostle Paul says, get away from baptism and begin to understand what it means. When you take yourself and submit it to the truth of the teachings of Christ or Buddha or Christian and raise it up into the air, which is the third stage of consciousness, you have been baptized. And you're ready now to be touched by the fire of the fourth stage.
states of consciousness, which is the higher mind. That's what it means when it says in the Bible, we will rise to meet Jesus in the air, here. How do I know that? Because Jesus said in John 14, 20, at that time you will know I am in the Father, you and me, and I in you. Where is he in me? He is in the air. That's why the angels have wings, because they are impulses up in the air, up in that third stage of consciousness. And as you rise from there, you are baptized. It has nothing to do with real water. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? You want to get your head wet? That think? Do you honestly believe there is a God on Pluto who is not going to let you off the hook unless you stick your head in the water? I mean, that's... That, oh, God, stick his head in the water. It has nothing to do with it. It doesn't mean it. never did mean it. It's talking about that second stage. Look at it. Go get a book. Look at every aspect of consciousness in the world, and you're going to find pretty much the same, except for the Chinese. Earth, water, air, or fire, and the renewed mind. And that's what it is. Now, let me see. What have we done? We've talked about a strange phenomenon, okay? An ancient mystical phenomenon. And what have we done? You're going to get out of here in a minute. And you can tell all the people they don't lock you in, they don't give Kool Aid or anything. We went in there. Yeah, look at the phenomenon. Well, what do we talk about tonight? We talk about the seven chakras, okay? The seven seals, okay? Didn't we? We talked about opening the right hemisphere of the brain. Huh? And we said all of that is within you, didn't we? And where does it come up? The spine. Right? Pretty heavy stuff. Hindu, mystic, ancient. What's this guy talking about this stuff in a Christian church while we sit here with our King James Bibles on our lap? How rude, how crude. Open the book. Open the Bible to page 229 in the New Testament of the book of Revelation. Let me show you something. Are you with me out there in television land? I forgot all about, <laughs> I forgot all about you. We've got to move the camera one of these days over because I never look over there. But, you know, I love you. Let's, let's take a look. Are you with me? Come on up here for a minute. The spine, the seven chakras of the seven seals within you open up the right hemisphere of the brain. Did you find, does everybody find this Revelation 5? Say, just mum, murmur something. Yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Revelation 5, let's look at it. And I saw in the right hand, which is the right hemisphere of the brain, of him that sat on the throne, which is the Sahasara, the higher chakra, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with. Is it in your Bible? Do you have a, does it say Bible on the front of the book? Why is that? And do you know what that is? Give me a break. Do you know what, what you've been taught as a Christian all your life? Is your name written in the book of life? That is the book of life, as defined in the book of Revelation. The seven chakras that rise up the spine to energize that which is the God consciousness within you, what opens the right hemisphere of the brain. There it is. <laughs> is your name, it says, your name written in the Lamb's book of life. But see, what I want to show you something. In mysticism, in the ancient language, the word name does not mean name. It means way. If you are going to do something the way I tell you, then the ancients would say you're doing it in my name. When Jesus said pray in his name, don't you always add your prayers in Jesus' name? Here's a surprise for you. You got the wrong guy. His name wasn't Jesus. What are you going to do with that? If you walk down the street and say, hey, Jesus, how you doing? The only place you'll find Jesus is in Puerto Rico or in Cuba. You're not finding Jesus over there. There is none. His name is Jehoshua. 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 So why not use the guy's real name? How would you like it if somebody walked up to you, Jack, and say, Hi, Phil. Well, why don't you call me Jack? Well, I don't want to call you Jack because my church says you're Phil. <laughs> so then uh, the God's up there on Pluto and he looks at this guy and says, Hey, what's all these people? What's this Jesus? Who's this Jesus guy? I think he plays for the Cuban All-Stars. I don't know who this guy is. His name wasn't Jesus. His name was Jehoshua. Why did you change his name? Why not use his real name? Why are we afraid to use his name? We could use Saddam Hussein's. We didn't change his name. I told you so. We used his name. Why not use Jesus? Jehoshua. And they would say, in Jehoshua's name. No, you can't do that. Why? Because tradition says we can't. But you know what Jesus Christ said? By your tradition, you have made the law of God of no effect. 
Can't even get the guys by name. So we're praying all these prayers, asking for peace in Jesus' name, and that's why there's always wars, because we're asking the wrong guy. Maybe this Jesus guy is the war god. Oh, please answer our prayers. Boom! <laughs> the wrong guy. What are you going to do? It doesn't mean name. It means way. It means that you are doing what he said. If you are praying in Jesus' name, you are praying in the way that he instructed, and the way that he instructed was seek first the kingdom which is within you, and all of these other things will come. Practice the single eye, cast your net to the right side, take no thought, look within yourself for the knowledge of the kingdom of God. If you do it that way, then you're going to be saved. Why? Because then you can, I can tell you one thing, regardless of what they write on the front of that building, we can always say in this place, we sit here and we meditate because of the Lordship of Jesus Christ who said, I want you to practice the single eye. And these people who are throwing their paint cans around have never done it. Never done it. And Jesus Christ looks at them in Luke 6, 46, and he says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I told you to do? Can't say that to you here. I'm not going to have a place where children come to this place and learn of the, of the hate and the venom that pours out of their adults who would do something like that. We don't send children out if you like that. We have children that learn only of Jesus, not of devils and demons and violence and hurt. They learn of Jesus Christ and they learn of Buddha and they learn of beautiful things of peace and love and nature. And not the, not the, not the fighting and the screaming and all that hate stuff. And so many beautiful things are being taught to the children here. And I see Yvette, Yvette is teaching the children of our Sunday school sign language, too, for the deaf, so that the children, as they begin to learn it, when they see it at an older person, they won't make fun of it. It won't be funny. They'll say, hey, I know how to do that. I know what it means. Watch. They have respect. They're one with it. And so that's beautiful. And we're all excited with the work that Yvette's doing with the children. That's something beautiful for children to learn. See? So the word means way. And is your way the way of the Lamb's Book of Life? Have you practiced the single eye? It takes a lot of, like Buddha said this morning, the hardest thing in the world for anybody to do is to change themselves. That's what you've got to do. That's the return to the Father's house. That's right there, is the seven turns around Joshua, around Jericho, to make the wall come down. It's the prodigal son who dwelt down in the lowest and raised himself up to the Father's house. Well, that's it. Now you know. And uh, as I said, it's an awful lot. And I didn't come here and tell you this tonight expecting you to take notes and write down and learn. I'm just trying to get you to see there's more to life and the universe and to God and to the magnificence of what God and Jesus Christ is than what you've been told. There's all of this. And it's in the Bible, as you, as you, as you saw. You know? Let me show you something. Can I just, I'll just show you one more thing, if you don't mind. Because this is neat. Um, go with me to uh, First Kings. It's in the Old Testament. I just want to show you, because there's some new, new folks here, and maybe you haven't seen this before. My nose is starting to itch, which means I'm onto something good. <laughs> I had a guy, I had a guy, guy called me up on television, says, ah, you rotten satanic cultist standing on television, picking your nose, and I know. <laughs> I said, no, it, 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 whenever I get excited, you know, it, it itches on the outside. I can't. I have to think of something. Maybe I can get a spray or something, you know. You with me? First Kings chapter 6, what page is it on? 269. 269 in the Old Testament. I want to show you something interesting. 296. 296. Okay, it was close. A little bit. Uh, little bit. But let's, let's we'll, we'll conclude it with this. I just wanted to show you something, all right? You with me? Page 296, First Kings chapter 6, all right? And verse 7. This is talking about the construction of what? The temple, okay? The temple. That Now remember, it's in you. And the house, the temple, when it was building, mean being constructed, was built of stone. That's the first thing. It's naturally built. It's not built of brick. Nothing of God in the Bible is built of brick. It's built of stone because it's natural, okay? And it was made ready before it was brought there, so there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was building. The temple is built in... Silence. Um, silence. Okay? Good? Watch this one. The door for the middle chamber, this is verse 8. The middle chamber is the Holy of Holies. 
The door for the middle chamber was in the right side of the house. That's you. That's in the right hemisphere of your brain. Okay? And they, meaning the energy, went up with winding stairs. That's the kundalini. That's the serpent. Watch this one. It's exactly what you see when you go to the doctor. That's the caduceus. That's the duality of the two serpents. It's also DNA, okay? Which is the same thing as what they're talking about. Went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber, which is the right hemisphere, okay? And out of the middle chamber into the third, okay? Come on with me now. And let me find this real quick, because it's just a little interesting thing that uh, you look at. And uh, oh, I hope I can find it. Uh, okay, 2 Corinthians, where is it? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Somebody find that page for me, okay? So I want to show you. Now, did you go with me here? The winding stairs take you up to the right side, out of the right, into the third. And we're talking about this winding power, okay? Are you, what is it? 173 or 174. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 173 or 174 in the New Testament. Let's, 173. Let me show you something interesting. This is the Apostle Paul talking. You with me now? Mm -hmm. I know a man in Christ above 14 years, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body. Oh, could he have had an out-of-body experience? Woo! Looks that way. Okay. I cannot tell. Chapter 12, verse 2. I can't, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. Such a one was caught up to the, which one? Third. Third heaven, okay? Now, what did we talk about before when we were talking about those five stages of consciousness in Greek? Earth, water, air. We will rise to meet him in the air. He was caught up to the third heaven, okay? And what happened here? As it says in the Bible, the energy goes up in a winding way. That's that serpentine kundalini motion up into the right hemisphere of the brain and out into the third, which is taking you up into that, which is nirvana or the place of silence, where you see the apostle Paul was taken to the third heaven. That's exactly what it's talking about. Okay. Now, what about this here on the right side? Because I, I showed you this before, and I'm going to end it right here. Just by showing. Go to the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and go to, page, uh, go to John chapter 21. And then we're done. Promise you. Promise you. But I don't get you that often. Some of you people I, I, I don't know if I've seen before, and probably after this little uh, tirade I may never see you again, so let me get you uh, at this point. John chapter 21, okay? You with me? Page 110 in your little Bible. Now go to John chapter 21 and verse 6. Where did, where did you see that in the temple they put the door to the holy chamber on the... Right side of the building, okay? Now Jesus Christ is going to say in John chapter 21 to the, uh, 6, Cast your net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. Okay? Find what? What did we say earlier? The number nine. Remember? The number nine means consciousness. Okay? Go to John chapter 21, verse 11. Right where you are, just go to verse 11. It says, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fish. How many did they catch? 153. One, five, three is nine. And that you'll find consistent throughout the entire Bible. So I showed it to you. I showed you that the temple construction is of silence. The holy place is at the right side. The winding stairs of Kundalini take you into the right side and that into the third, which is air, where we will rise to meet Jesus in the air. I showed you the Apostle Paul had an inner or outer body experience in which he rode up to the third stage of consciousness, which is absolute silence. And I showed you what Jesus Christ said, if you want to find, cast your net to the right side, and you catch 153, which means divine consciousness. That's Kundalini. That's the seven chakras. That's Om. That's what this whole thing is about. And unfortunately, even though it's in this book, nobody's ever told you. Nobody's ever revealed it. Because, basically, of the same reason they spray paint on this building. It's a prejudice against that of the East, a prejudice of against that of, of, of an ancient wisdom that these people could not manage to deal with coming out of the dark ages of Europe. There's a book, sometimes you want to get it, it's called The Lost Books of the Bible. And in The Lost Books of the Bible, there's a book written by John, same John of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he talks about Thomas, excuse me, it's written by Thomas, it's the Acts of Thomas, and it talks about John. And John was watching, and he stood there with the crucifixion, and Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross. And John said he cried, and he couldn't deal with it anymore. So he ran up the hill to where he knew there was a cave, and he ran up the mountain, and he ran into this cave. And as he got into the cave, there was a light, and there was Jesus standing there laughing. 
And he said, hey, what is this? And Jesus said, hey, John, the things that they said I suffered, I didn't. And he went out and he looked down again. And he went down the hill and it says, John said he walked away past the crucifixion and he laughed knowing that God had done all of this symbolically for the salvation of man. It's in the book. That was not allowed to be entered in the Bible by the church during the Dark Ages. It's there. There's a lot of stuff that you need to read just to look at. Not to believe anything, but just to explore. Open your mind to it. Because once you do that, the truth will come from within. Thank you very much for sharing.